The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradi a tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? Jesus replies, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but with their hearts they are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that we might have been uh, used to help their father or mother is Corbin, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus, you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside of a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, is what comes out of a person that defiles them. And he had left the crowd and entered the house. His disciples asked him about the parable. He said, are you so dull, he asked? Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomachs, and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all food clean. He went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. This is the sermon text for today. Gracious God, as we bring this sermon to you, I would ask, Lord, that you would speak through me, that you would open our eyes, open our hearts, so that we can truly hear and apply and be challenged by what you have to say today. Let nothing that I would do today with my outward abilities and physical body in any way distract from what you are saying. Help us in this, through Christ our Lord, amen. Lip service. We've been preaching, preaching through the book of Mark, and by the way, next week is uh, Mission Sunday, so we will take a break, and I will be preaching a mission-minded message. But we've been preaching through the book of Mark, and we are now up to Mark chapter 7 and verses 1 through 23 in a sermon that is titled, Lip Service. Now, one of the greatest challenges for the church throughout the centuries has been understanding the difference between legalism, or religion, and the gospel. It's been one of the greatest struggles for us as a church and for the church universal and for the local church. It's easier than you may think and it's easier than you may realize to confuse religion with gospel, to confuse religious people with gospel driven people, to confuse religious people with those who have had a change of heart after believing the gospel and putting their faith in Jesus Christ. The interesting thing is that from the outside, the two things can look similar, but in fact, they are very different. They're very different. Let me see if I can illustrate this in some way. Take two models, two male models, and you look at them from the outside and you, both, you see that both of them have chiseled physiques and handsome looks. And so you assume that both of them are healthy because they look alike from the outside. However, one of those models has a bad heart. 
because he's damaged it with the use of steroids and other illegal substances. And his so-called so chisel-looking abdominals are actually painted on. And makeup hides the unhealthy uh, complexion of his skin. And so we discover as we talk with him and we go on and spend more time with him that he has a very low regard for himself and uh, as a creation of God. He is always uneasy about his body. And we look at the other model who looks the same from uh, the outside. Um, but we discover in spending time with him that this model is different because he's very health conscious. And he's, based, uh, uh, he's basing the way that he lives his life and, and the way he treats his body on the outside is based on an internal decision that he was a creation of God and valued by God. And so in response to that, he wanted to be a good steward of his body and he cares for his body well, but he doesn't idolize his body. The two models approach life differently but they appear the same from the outside. And the only way that you know that they are different is when you spend time around them and through observation and, and a continued journey with them, you begin to see that actually they're not that similar. Well, in the same way, we can look at the comparison between religion and the gospel uh, as being the same. Because this is a similar comparison between religious people and those who have been changed by the gospel. And it is that truth that now Jesus comes to illustrate in this, power, in this story or encounter with the religious leaders of his day, who were called the Pharisees and scribes. Now, one of the interesting things that we think about before we get into this passage is that religious people think they get close to God and stay close to God by their external behavior and performance of religious traditions. They believed that they were morally um, pure as a result of that. And so the religious people of the day of that day, in Jesus' day, were the Pharisees, who were a group of religious leaders in Israel who had been around for some 400 years, and uh, uh, along with some scribes uh, who were people who copied and interpreted scripture. Now, I want you to know something about the scribes and the Pharisees, the Pharisees in particular. The Pharisees would be welcome in all of our churches today. They'd be welcome in most churches today because they will be teaching and holding ministry positions. They were the people who made it their business to try to discredit Jesus because he was this new and upcoming rabbi uh, who was undermining them as his uh, fame grew and his notoriety grew in the area. And so, the scripture begins, uh, and the text begins, and the story begins with a group of them, a group of Pharisees and scribes, coming up from Jerusalem to confront Jesus as they had done earlier in Mark chapter 2 and verses 18 and 24. And they confronted Jesus with a particular um, issue. They confronted Jesus about why his disciples didn't follow the ceremonial purification and hand washing prescribed by their oral law. Now, I want you to know something. Don't be fooled by this question. This was not a simple question of hygiene. It wasn't about just washing your hands. It was actually a question about religious purity and authority. This was a ceremonial uh, uh, washing that they did. If you, if you read in uh, and if you know a little bit uh, more about the context and about the, the ceremony, 
This hand washing that they would practice was a ceremonial washing to cleanse them from their contact with the corrupted sinners or non-Jewish people. And this involved dipping one's hands in water and lifting up the hands so that the water ran down the forearms and off the elbows. And this was one of the many oral laws previous, pre previous uh, leaders and Pharisees had created and given the same authority as the written law of God or the Torah. They felt that they were better, more spiritual, closer to God than those people who didn't do this, who didn't follow their oral laws. And so Jesus responds to that confrontation. And Jesus burst their bubble and exposed a shocking fact. Religious activity does not mean your heart is good with God. Religious activity does not mean that our heart is good with God. It doesn't mean that. Because you will notice it with this confrontation that rather than answer their question, and their question wasn't a genuine question, it was a, a question to try to undermine Jesus. Rather than answer their question, Jesus immediately moved to the issue of authority and brought up a very, very shocking challenge. He showed that they didn't understand the gospel and that they misinterpreted or broke the law of God to follow their own oral traditions. You look at verses 1 through 8. You look at verse 5. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked him, Why don't you, your disciples, follow our age-old traditions? They eat without first performing the hand-washing ceremony. Jesus doesn't ask the question. As a matter of fact, Jesus answered the real issue. Because the question wasn't really the issue. The question was just a symptom of the real issue. The real issue was an issue of the heart. Religious activity does not mean that our heart is right with God, that our heart is good with God. And, and what Jesus uh, confronts them with in verses 6 through 8 is that he tells them, you're hypocrites. You're hypocrites. He was telling them, you don't understand the gospel. They were hypocrites, people who wore a religious mask, giving lip service to God, but in fact they had cold hearts. They didn't really know God because their hearts had not been changed. This was the same thing that the prophet Isaiah, Jesus says, had seen hundreds of years earlier in the people of, of Israel. And nothing had changed by this time, 400 years later. The Pharisees thought, as many of us do, that their religious activities, their religious ceremonies purified them made them right with God and please God. But in fact, it was the opposite because their hearts were unchanged. They were hypocrites. And God rejected their worship because they gave him lip service instead of heart service. He said, you're performing all of these religious activities and you think these religious activities purify you. You think these religious activities give you preference with me. And so you may ask the question, how do you know that they had uh, hard hearts? And that all they were doing is giving him lip service, giving God lip service. We know that they had hard hearts because even though they acted religious on the outside, They ignored God's word and replaced it with their own words on the inside. They acted religious on the outside. Right? And, and, and they, they had all these uh, ceremonies that they were performing, uh, uh, but, but they did not have a changed heart. Only changed hearts will submit to God's word with joy continually. Only change hearts will submit to God's word. 
And what they had done is that they had taken God's word and they had replaced it with their own traditions. Now, what do we do with this? What do we do with this replacing of the word of God? Well, here's the thing. When there's a clash between scripture and tradition, I would suggest to you that you follow God's word. That's really what we're to do. When there's a clash between scripture and tradition, we follow God's word. And that's what Jesus really brings to the forefront in verses 9 through 13. Because in verse 9 he says, then he said, you skillfully sidestep God's law in order to hold on to your own tradition." The Pharisees had allowed their man-made traditions to take priority. Now, by the way, traditions are not all bad, and traditions are often not bad. But what happens is that the, the uh, Pharisees had allowed their man-made traditions to take priority, and you hear the word, to take priority over God's clearly stated scriptures, and this was reflected in the way, and one of the ways that this was reflected is in how they treated their parents, or korban, as it was called. In scripture it says, honor your, your parents, honor your mother and father. And it was agreed that providing for parents financially was implied in the command to honor your parents, to provide for them financially when they get old and they're struggling. However, these Pharisees found a way, these religious people found a way to get out of that by deciding that if a son dedicated the portion of his estate to God that would have been used to support his parents, he was free from his obligation to support his parents. And what's interesting about that is when they made up that rule and made up that law, actually that money was not given to God because it was spent on their pleasures because the money was not given to God until after your, your death. So they had put their rules above the word of God. And they were actually disobeying and ignoring the word of God and had replaced it with their traditions. They became their own gods as a result because they rejected God's law and made their own God um, law representing that as the law of God. So it superseded and replaced actually the word of God. They actually manipulated God's word to their own advantage. And so we would encourage, we, we can be encouraged and exhorted today, don't do that. Instead, we should submit to the word and the authority of God expressed in his word. But the question arises is, why didn't they do it? And why don't we do it? Why didn't they do it? And why don't we do it? I'll tell you why. Most often, it's because our hearts like theirs, was never changed. Only our outward behavior has changed. We've been through um, behavior modification, but not heart change. We, are, we were actually um, acting in a role. That's what a hypocrite was. A hypocrite, a Hippocrates, was a person who, took, who acted a role and they would take a paper mask and put it in front of their face and they would play a role. They would pretend to be somebody else. That's what a hypocrite is. And so, this is what we should not do. But why do we do it? We do it because our hearts haven't been changed. Kevin DeYoung illustrates this well in a book called a Hole in, uh, The Hole in Our Holiness. And he said this, the Pharisees were externally moral 
but their hearts were often far from God. It's all too easy to turn the fight of faith into sanctification by checklists. Take care of a few bad habits, develop a couple good ones, and you're set. But a moral checklist doesn't take into consideration the idols of the heart. It, might, it may not even have the gospel as part of the equation. And in, inevitably, checklist spirituality is highly selective. So you end up feeling successful at sanctification because you, stopped, you, stopped, you stayed away from drugs, you lost weight, you served at the soup kitchen, and you renounced styrofoam. But you've ignored gentleness, humility, joy, sexual purity, because God has not really gotten to your heart. And so this is what Jesus is reminding us and reminding them. And I know this still happens because we don't understand the gospel and how it's different from religion because the gospel actually is the only thing that can address our heart issues because our hearts haven't changed. You see, if, you, if our hearts haven't changed, our behavior will ultimately not change. Our behavior can be modified for a season, but it has not really changed because our hearts haven't changed. And so Jesus now brings to us the confrontation, the realization that Jesus is reminding us uh, and, uh, and reminding them that this happens because we don't really understand the gospel and how different the gospel is from religion. And this is what Jesus says to us. And it's a challenge. This is the hardest part of this message. In verses 14 through 23. The gospel works from the inside out, not from the outside in. The gospel of Jesus Christ, it works from the inside. The gospel works from the inside out, not from the outside in. See? And that's the reason why Jesus gets into this um, discussion with, with the crowd and also with the, with the disciples afterwards about uh, uh, it's not uh, what goes into your body that defiles you. You're defiled by what comes from your heart. And then he goes, Jesus goes into the house and explains this to the disciples. Because they didn't really fully get it either. And so he says that, you know, food doesn't defile you. Well, what goes in from, comes in from the outside doesn't defile you. It's what's in your heart that defiles you. Right? So what keeps us from God comes from the heart and then it's expressed outwardly. Therefore, the cure for that, also the cure for a, a, a bad heart, has to address the, this hard heart issue so that the outward behavior is changed. The outward behavior will change if the heart issues are changed. And so Jesus uses this illustration of food and the stomach to explain this truth to us. And even today, we struggle with this truth. What keeps us from God and defiles us comes from the inside, which is the heart. And the heart is, it's not this organ that pumps in your chest. That's not what we're talking about. And you know, people put their hand over their heart. It feels very, oh, I love you with my heart. It's, we're not talking about this organ that's pumping, all right? The heart, biblically, is the center of our personhood. And it includes the will, the emotions, the mind, our morals, our desires. The heart is supposed to be, according to 2 Corinthians 1 and 22, the heart is supposed to be the dwelling place of God. 
That's what our heart was really designed for. It was supposed to be the dwelling place of God. But we have locked God out. And what, you, what is in your heart actually is what bears fruit on the outside. No matter how hard you try to pretend. Eventually, what's in your heart is going to come out on the outside. You can pretend for a while. I can pretend for a while, but eventually it's going to come out. It is the sin in our heart that makes us unacceptable to God. So we have to change our heart, not just try to change our behavior. And so people say, I'm going to try harder. I'm going to change my behavior, and I'm going to get right with God. I've heard this over the years. How many people say, I can't come to... Uh, church service yet because I got to get right with God and I said good luck to you you haven't understood the gospel right? the Pharisees had been trying to change their hearts and make themselves acceptable to God by observing in the Jewish Talmud over 248 commandments thou shalt not and 365 prohibitions uh, 248 commandments, sorry, thou, thou shall, and 365 prohibitions, thou shall not. That's a lot of law. And guess what? It had failed. Because they didn't understand that the gospel works from the inside out, not the outside in. See? And that's a fundamental difference. It's a life-changing difference. The gospel is not like religion. Religion says behavior modification. Follow the traditions. Traditions are not bad. But if traditions aren't motivated and connected to and immersed in the word of God and the, the change of heart, then... They become nothing but empty traditions. And actually, over time, they will begin to contradict and replace the word of God. Which brings us to a very important and critical matter. Okay, we know your Pastor Mike. Okay, I understand you're saying the heart has to be changed and, and uh, the Pharisees couldn't change their hearts and you can't change hearts by, by behavior modification. Well, how do you change hearts? Well, here's the answer. And Jesus is pointing to it by inference in everything that Scripture in the New Testament says. Only Jesus can truly change our hearts. Only God can truly change our hearts. Only Jesus can truly change our hearts. Religious people pay all of their attention to their external behavior, but they ignore the heart. They spend too much time worrying about what you eat, how you dress, how you wash your hands. Now, I'm not saying those things are not important, and I'm not saying those are not good traditions, but they are not to be traditions that replace the authority of God and the word of God. Now, I know none of you would admit it, but all of us, myself included, have a bit of the religious spirit in us. We all do. We all do. I am a recovering Pharisee. I'm in therapy right now. I am recovering from my religious spirit. And all of us have a little bit of the religious spirit in us. The disciples didn't really understand this parable or story, and they showed that they had some of the religious spirit in them too. That's why Jesus had to explain to them that the gospel is from the inside out, not the, in, not the outside in. You say, what's defiling you is not coming from the outside.
And so Jesus is saying, I am the only one who can heal you. Putting your faith in Jesus is the only way that our hearts can be cured, that our hearts can be changed. God promised Israel something that he's promised us today, and Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of that. God promised Israel that he would give them a new spirit within and he would take away their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. That's in, Isaiah, uh, in Ezekiel chapter 11 and verse 19. In Ezekiel chapter 11 and verse 19. So Jesus Christ is the one who is the New Testament fulfillment of that. And I know that because in Romans 10 and 9, it says, if you will declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For what? For it is with the heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So this is no longer lip service. This is heart service. Our heart will resist everything. Everything that comes from the outside. So all of your outward efforts to change your heart and reject the word of God will result in frustration. Because you can't change your heart. The only way your heart can be changed is by faith in Jesus the Christ. And why do I say this? Because truthfully, the heart without Jesus is a depraved heart. Without Jesus, it's a depraved heart. You and I can't change our heart, but we're going to try. And we have been trying for centuries. We've been trying, and the best imitation that we come up with is a moral behavior modification which does not please God because our heart remains unchanged. So we look really religious on the outside. We perform all of the religious traditions, but we show that we are really not changed because we have an inability to submit to the authority of God's word over time. And under pressure, what happens is that we will revert back to the natural predisposition of our heart because the real problem is internal. The real problem is internal. In 1989, when elderly Adele Gabori turned up missing, her concerned neighbors in Worcester, Massachusetts, informed the police about it. And a brother told police that actually she had gone into a nursing home, so Gabori's neighbors began watching her property. One neighbor, Michael Crowley, noticed that her mail slot was piling high and notified police so that the deliveries were ended and all the mail was tidied up. Another neighbor, uh, Eileen Dugan, started paying her grandson to mow the lawn of, um, of Miss uh, Gabori. And later, uh, Dugan's son noticed that Gabori's pipes had frozen, spilling water out, onto, uh, out the door, the front door of the house. And the utility company was call to shut off the water. What's interesting about all of this is that while they were addressing all of the outward things that were going on, no one, what no one guessed was that while they had been trying to help, Gabori had been inside her house. And when police finally investigated the house as a health hazard, because over time it began to diminish, they were shocked to discover her body inside the house. The Washington Post in October the 27th, 1993, reported that police believed that Gabori died of natural causes four years before. The respectable external appearance of Gabori's house 
in the beginning had hidden the reality of what was on the inside. There was death and dying. And something similar, I believe, can happen to people, can happen to all of us. All sorts of religious activity may be happening on the outside, but we are spiritually dead on the inside. And our hearts need to be cured. And the only way we can do that is we need supernatural external help for a new cured heart. We need supernatural help outside of ourselves. We need supernatural help. And that is accomplished only through faith in Jesus Christ. Because what Jesus does is he takes your old heart and he puts it to death on his cross. And in return, he gives you a new heart because he becomes your heart as you are united with him. He becomes your heart. And when you give in to him and you let his Holy Spirit control you, you will express what is in his heart and it will become what is in your heart. And over time, the expressions of that will grow as you give yourself over to the influence and the control of the Holy Spirit. So that expressions of that will grow. But even then, here's the problem for all of us. For those of us who say, well, I'm already a, a Christian. I, I've got this all together. Here's the danger. But even then, if you don't continue to yield to Jesus and to guard your hearts, part of it can become cold and hard. We won't have a pure heart. What is a pure heart? It's a heart that is undivided in devotion to God because we allow sin and, uh, and evil to infiltrate it. And here's the interesting and wonderful thing that I want you to know today. God gives us grace in Jesus to do even that. He gives us grace for that. So here's the difference between the gospel and religion. The gospel is about what Jesus has done. And you respond to it while religion is what you do to save yourself in place of God. And if you want to know today where you are in that story, you just have to ask this question. And I encourage you, those of you who are listening who believe, I, I am a believer. I, I, I don't have to struggle with this. I ask you, you're wrong. Be, be you a believer or a non-believer. Be you a Christian or a non-Christian. We all have to ask the question continually so that you'll know where you are. Here's the question. Am I willing to obey God's word no matter the cost? Because I know that Jesus died for me and joyfully endured suffering and death so that I can live. Otherwise, I would die. If you can say yes, if you can say yes, then you're not given lip service. You really are a believer, and you understand that you started by grace, and you have to continue by grace. But if you can't answer that question, yes, then your heart needs to be healed by Jesus from the inside out so that you can honor him outwardly. Your heart needs to be healed by Jesus on the inside so that you can honor him on the outside. And so today, I would express to you, brothers and sisters, you ask the question. And if you want to know more about this and you want to work through and think through the answer to that question so that your relationship with Jesus can deepen, or your relationship with Jesus can begin, I would 
invite you to give me a call. Call the church number. You can call one of our elders or, one of, or speak with one of our deacons. And we would love to have this conversation and to have an ongoing conversation with you about the difference between the gospel and religion. Because it's going to be a tension for the rest of our lives. But today, you can alleviate that tension by p putting your faith in Jesus Christ and continuing in him and accepting that Jesus has done it all and because of what he has done, we have a new heart when we put our faith in him. And we will see the continuing expressions of the heart of Jesus being lived out through our lives and through our actions to the glory of God. Amen. Lord, we will all wrestle with the idea of being a people who are truly walking in the reality of a transformed heart. We cannot change our hearts. We have been tried, we have been trying to do this for centuries. We've been trying to do this for thousands of years. We can't do it. Only you can change our hearts. So today, Father, we open ourselves and we say, Lord Jesus, we believe in you and believe that the gospel of Jesus Christ and what Jesus has done on the cross was sufficient and that in his resurrection, and his ascension and his imminent return, that as we put our faith in that, that he is the fulfillment of the promise that he will give us a new heart and put a new spirit within us. And so by faith, we accept that and embrace that. And by faith and by grace through faith, as a gift from you, Lord, we will walk in that. Help us through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. At this time, I want to encourage you, if there are any of you who are so moved, one of the things that I want to uh, constantly thank you for and remind you is that you have been supporting us in ministry of giving. And one of the things that uh, we will continue